thank you everybody. It's great to be here today and talk to you about a topic that I'm very excited about. That is the ways of the software people and the trend that's going on in the world of the advancement of software and uh, by, uh, by contrast, the ways of the dodo. So to uh, start, <laughs> to start uh, this story, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Twilio just to give the background on what we do. We are a communications as a service company. Uh, what our product does is we are software infrastructure in the cloud to power applications that communicate. And so enterprises that you've heard of and innovative startups that you probably work with every day uh, are powering their communications capabilities via our platform. And applications that have been built by over 400,000 developers run on Twilio. Those applications have interacted with over 95% of American adults and have reached subscribers in over 200 countries. And so you can see the amount of innovation that's going on in the world of software is pretty astounding. Um, but the story of Twilio doesn't start six years ago when we started the company. It actually begins 150 years ago when Alexander Graham Bell connected a speaker, a microphone, and some copper to create the first telephone. And the amazing thing about the 150 years that have ensued since that event is that while the technology has gotten substantially more complex and interesting and complicated and powerful, how we use the telephone has actually changed very little. We still make a phone call and we say hello. That's what they were doing 150 years ago. If you think about it, the phone app on the computer in your pocket is, doesn't really do much that you couldn't do 30 years ago. Right? And that's interesting, and we believe that's because communications has been for the longest time tightly coupled to the physical nature of the network and what it could do. And so at Twilio, we're here to migrate communications from its legacy in hardware to its future in software. Let's take a look at what, what uh, one such company is doing with our platform and that migration. Uber is everyone's private driver. You get out your iPhone, you push a button, and in five minutes, a town car arrives. It's a pretty seamless experience. It kind of feels like you're living in the future. The information about the driver, about his star rating, about his phone number, about how far away he is, we're sending those updates via text. You can't have your own private driver without having a great customer experience. If the car's waiting for 10 minutes and you haven't been told, there's a problem. And it's crucial for the rider to have that information so that he can connect with the driver. We built the Uber experience without Twilio initially. And the problem was, people were not getting the high quality experience that we were promising. And the kinds of problems that we were seeing with the other providers, we just have not seen with Twilio. Straight up, I sleep easier, my engineers sleep easier, because we're not dealing with situations where it's taking 10, 15, 20 minutes for a text to be delivered. It's been invaluable to have a reliable service to tell folks what's going on with their ride. Twilio works fast like we do. Uber is now launching in a lot of international markets and Twilio is helping us with that because they operate in a lot of different international markets. The messages are delivered very quickly, we can rely on it. And it's helped us scale internationally as we grow as a company. Our global vision is really one of cities, not really about countries. If there's a major city somewhere out there, you can be pretty certain that Uber's going to be there. Having one telecommunications provider that ultimately will cover all the countries and cities that we go to, that's critical for us. As a customer, we've just had a really great experience. I like to work with companies that have the same kind of vision and foresight. Twilio looks at a customer experience and really designs the product around it. And that's how I feel about what Uber does as well. So what you, can, what you can see is a company saying we're software and communications is core to how we create a great customer experience and create a great product. And so that's why Twilio is here to democratize communications, empowering companies to integrate and innovate their communications at the pace of software. And that last bit is the most important part. See, uh, my, my background, I'm a software person, I'm an engineer by my education, uh, was the first CTO at StubHub, and I ran into this problem first all the way back in the year 2000 when we were building StubHub. We said, if we're gonna let someone buy a ticket 
at the last minute before an event, we need to call the seller and say, hey, seller, we're sending a, uh, uh, your ticket sold, we're sending a courier to pick it up from you. Then we needed to dial down a list of couriers, find one who could do the delivery, and then call the uh, buyer and say, hey, buyer, the courier's showing up in two minutes at this corner. Make sure you're ready, right? It was how we were going to power our business, but when we went and looked at the uh, ecosystem, communications, how do we do this? We found vendors selling us these pre-packaged black boxes, right, PBXs. That's how they were saying you're supposed to solve this problem, but that didn't make sense to us because they said it would take 18 to 24 months to implement and cost millions of dollars. We said, we're software people. That doesn't make sense to us. We operate in weeks, not years. And I had another interesting experience in my career. Uh, I was at AWS, Amazon Web Services, and a most interesting thing happened in my time at Amazon. We were at an all-hands meeting, uh, the whole company in an auditorium, and uh, somebody asked a question of Jeff Bezos, uh, something along the lines of, are we going to open retail physical stores or something? I don't even remember the question, but what I remember very distinctly was his answer. He said, in case you don't know, Amazon is not a retailer. We're a software company. It just so happens that instead of you know, shipping operating systems and we're processors, we make boxes show up at people's doors. But we're a software company nonetheless. In fact, our ability to win is our ability to arrange magnetic particles on hard drives better than our competition. And that really got me thinking about software companies and software people, right? And you think about it, software people solve business problems with magnetic particles. How cool is that? And if you keep extrapolating, who are software people? What is it? It's interesting, it's not just developers. People think of you know, coders and hackers. It's not just developers, but actually it is not a skill set, it is a mindset. It is the mindset that lets you see the world through the lens of software. It's the mindset that causes you to say, how can software solve this business problem? Whatever that problem is. Because software people fundamentally believe that any business problem can be solved once it's in the domain of software. And this is fascinating, right? Again, it's everybody in the organization who thinks this way and has this mindset. It's not just the people in your organization who write code. And what's amazing about 2014 is that more and more of the world's markets are addressable by software people, by this mindset. Let me walk you through what I mean about this. Software generalized is the notion that you're going to take in some part of the world into a computer, do some computation, and spit something back out into the real world. That's the generalized notion of a computer. If it didn't do that, it wouldn't be useful to us. We wouldn't know what was going on inside the box. And so what you see is a progression of more and more of the world that we're able to compute on as we've progressed the, uh, the state of computers. And so you can actually look at the last 60, 70 years as what started as numerical problems for the first 20 years, right? Number crunching, missile trajectories, census data. And then the next 20 years, textual problems, right? Word processors and spreadsheets, and the computer moved into the office. And then the next 20 years, multimedia problems, video, audio, and we got MP3s and YouTube. And now I believe we're in the next phase of computation. That is the everything else phase. As we suck more of the world into computers, we can solve more and more of the world's problems. And so if you think about software and you say on the left side, there's these sensors, and on the right side, there are these actuators, right? Sensing some part of the world and then actuating something back out into the world. The reason why you see this going on today is because we have this proliferation of sensors and actuators sucking in more and more of the physical world into the world of computation. And the primary reason for this is the smartphone. Right, this thing is just a bucket of sensors and actuators sitting in all of our pockets out in the real world, connected to the internet and connected to computation all the time. But that's not it. You also see a wide variety of companies going and bridging the physical world into the world of computers. And there's an interesting thing that happens when they do. I got a few examples. How many of you have a remote control for your cable box that looks something like this? Right, and they advertise it's got 180 buttons, like that's progress over the 170 button model. And, um, but the problem with this is this is the hardware mentality, right? This is not software people, because everything this remote would do was baked into the functionality when it rolled off an assembly line. So when software people approach TV, this is what they do. Right? That's the Apple TV remote. It's basically got four buttons. Why does it only have four buttons? Because that preserves the real power of the product you bought, which is software. Software that can be updated all the time to fix bugs, change, uh, address changing market conditions, add new features, new functionality, and delight the customer. Let's look at another example, payments. 
You, know, you walk into a store and they've got this little thing on the, on the register, right? But everything this machine would do to accept a payment was designed and engineered and baked into it when it rolled off the assembly line. Right, and you contrast that with a company like Square. Right, that tiny little piece of plastic is the minimal bridge required to bridge the physical world into the world of software. And then every other bit of the solution is implemented in software. Why? Because it can be updated all the time. They can ship updates every day, every week, making that product better. That's the power of software. Let's look at another unlikely place, right? Your car. Most people, if their car, right, if you have a car and you decide you want new features, you want a better car, you sell your car and you buy a new one, right? That's how it works. But that is not true if you're the owner of a Tesla. Almost every non-essential piece of physicality has been removed from this car so that they can update it, that software, over the air however often they want. And you see this in action, right? When most auto manufacturers, you know, have a, you know, something happens, they do a recall, it costs them millions and millions of dollars. Uh, but at Tesla, right, they had that, that thing last year with the car hit something on the road and there was a fire and everybody made a big hullaboo about it. And so what did they do? They issued an over-the-air update that increased the ride height of the car by two inches at freeway speeds. Done. Problem solved. Right? That's the power of software. It's amazing. Let's look at phones. Right? This was the most popular phone in the world when the iPhone came out. And what did the iPhone do? It got rid of all the physical elements it could and replaced it with software so that you could take that keyboard and insert it whenever you need it, whenever the software needed the keyboard. And then they could uh, uh, innovate and use that screen space for whatever was relevant to the customer at that point in time. That's as consumers. Let's think about enterprise, right? This is the latest and greatest phone from Cisco. Look at all those buttons, right? I know what you're thinking. You're like, Cisco employs 20, 30,000 software developers. How do you say they're not software people? Well, and I'll use my best Jeff Foxworthy impersonation. You might not be software people when this is how you scale it out. <laughs> and that's not Photoshopped. That is an actual product photo from the Cisco website. Right? We as software people know that this is the ideal telephone, a speaker and a microphone. That's the minimum you need to bridge the physical world into the world of software, right? So you see this, software people preserve the flexibility of software. This is key, this is fundamental to the software ethos because software people move fast, we iterate quickly, we're always shipping, we're listening to our customers, getting feedback and iterating to improve our product and win. That's core. What you call that is agility. And software people live it. And so what we hear company after company, enterprises asking all the time, and every company is in search of agility, saying, how, how do we get us some of that agility, right? And there's a solution. You see leading companies adopting this approach, the composable enterprise. Right? This is what companies are doing to further accelerate their ability to innovate and their ability to keep up in this software world. So companies who adopt this composable enterprise approach are buying smaller blocks of technology. Instead of buying that big monolith, they're buying pieces and putting them together. Because they value continuous iteration, continuous improvement over a monolithic vendor solution. That's what's valued by the composable enterprise. And most interestingly, you can look at my own career uh, uh, trajectory as you can actually see this, right? I started my first company in 1997. We were buying and racking our own servers. Then in 2000, I started my next company. We were renting servers by the year. In 2003, I started my next company. We were renting servers by the month. And when I started Twilio, we were renting by the hour from Amazon Web Services, right? Smaller and smaller blocks, more composable, more flexible, right? That's key. And it's not just servers. It's actually all the different pieces of infrastructure that you might need to innovate with. Let's look at Twilio, a similar thing, right? I mentioned our problem at, at StubHub, right? The legacy in the industry was you had to go buy the PBX. But Twilio, we have this pay-as-you-go model. So you don't buy the PBX, you buy the minute. You buy the message. That lets you buy something narrow or a smaller block that lets you build on top of. And it's not just minutes and messages, where it's all the primitives of business communication that you can now pull off the shelf when you need to solve a certain problem. And so what you see in the composable enterprise is companies composing these elements 
to create that unique customer experience. And this is critical. According to Forrester Research, the only source of competitive advantage is the one that can survive technology-fueled disruption, an obsession with customer experience. Right, you just heard Travis from Uber obsess over their customer experience. And I believe this is true. In fact, in 2014, you no longer get brownie points for using servers. You only get points for serving users. And that's the crux of the story. If you think about it, this is a process of natural selection. Companies that adopt most quickly, that adapt most quickly, are going to survive. And so I believe that because of this, every industry will become a software industry. It's as simple as that, because software is the most adaptable. So the old, you know, age-old build versus buy debate that companies always go through, I don't believe that's relevant anymore. It's basically become build versus die. You have to differentiate, and software is how you're going to do it, or else you're going to go the way of the dodo. And that's the ways of software people and the ways of the dodo. I have one quick note that I want to add to the end. Uh, Twilio believes that uh, in order to innovate, you need a solid foundation upon which to innovate. Today is a day of action to let the government know how you feel about net neutrality. Twilio supports net neutrality. And we advise you to contact your government representatives, the FCC, and your members of Congress, and let them know. Here's a website that will help you do that, battleforthenet.com. Today is the day of action. Today is the day to do it. We support net neutrality. Thank you very much, everybody. We can't wait to see what you're going to build.